Uh, I just, before we get started, I wanted to thank John and Mc, McNally Jackson so much for hosting this event tonight. Um, many writers will say that they owe their careers to independent bookstores. And uh, I would concur with that. Uh, in my early days, independent bookstores hand sold my books. And then as the years went by, uh, various bookstores welcomed me back time after time to do readings. So I think many of us feel that the independent bookstores are really the heart and soul of the writing community in the United States. So, um, and now with these Zoom events, uh, those of us who've had our book tours canceled, the independent bookstores are really trying to give us a leg up by doing these Zoom events. So if any of you are inspired to buy a book by anything that Marcy and I say tonight, it would be wonderful if you could um, order it via the link that McNally Jackson will have um, alongside the, the screen. So uh, the other thing was I wanted to thank the audience out there. I don't know who's there because we can't see or hear anybody but each other. But uh, I do know that uh, some friends and relatives are watching from the UK and from Australia and from Canada and from Florida and California, Tennessee, Vermont, Rhode Island, uh, as well as New York City. So uh, I want to thank you all for taking the time to be here in your different time zones. And now I will turn it over to Marcy. Thank you. That was just such a nice introduction because independent bookstores are kind of making it possible for us to keep on reading. Like there's been no libraries in the last few months. And one of my great pleasures has been putting an order at my local bookstore and I go to the backyard of the store and I pick up my book. And it's like one of the things that's been making me happy. So I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled that we can keep on having events. And so I loved reading your book. That was a pleasure. And Liza's book, um, Swan Song, was actually like, also was like, it was about a woman who was grieving but it was also really funny, which I really appreciated. And that's like a, that's a complicated trick, like to be funny when you're writing about grief. And I, I just love humor and writing. And so one of the things, this was actually my daughter Nina's 10 and, and I was completely unprepared like until 15 minutes ago. And I said, what should she ask? What should I ask Liza? And she said, well, ask her, why didn't she write this book? And I thought that's a really good question because novels just take a long time and we could write about anything. And so like, well, why do you think you wrote this book about Jesse who goes on a cruise ship to be a doctor? Like how, how did that come to be? <laughs> so. uh, uh, actually, it started out as a um, murder mystery. I, See, I, that's fascinating. <laughs> I, you know, I took a six week uh, cruise through the Middle East and Southeast Asia on the Queen Mary one time and um, yeah. Uh, my traveling companion and I took a tour of the ship and we saw all these great places to dispose of bodies. So I thought, well, why not write a murder mystery set on a cruise ship? So um, I started writing. I'd stay in the cabin and write and my friend would go out and uh, meet people and, and uh, look for material. And then she'd come back and tell me what she found. And, and I so guess there is there's something that happens in this, this story, right? That could be considered a murder, so. Well, yeah, yeah, my friend found somebody that was so obnoxious that yeah. we both thought that she needed to be killed. So, well, that's, that's awesome. yeah, yeah. So I, I wrote a, my first chapter uh, with her as, as the intended victim. And then yeah. when I got home from the cruise, um, I read it and I thought, oh God, you know, there's so many great uh, mystery writers and it's a whole new skill set that I don't have and I'm yeah. too old to learn new tricks. So I just put it away for a couple of years. And then I came back to it and I thought, well, I can't write a murder mystery, but it fits right into what I do like to write, which is the quest novel. So yeah. it became the first chapter of my uh, quest novel, trying to deal with grief and old age. Meanwhile, my parents had both died. And um, yeah. so uh, I always deal with issues by writing fiction about them. Yeah. yeah. And you did keep the murder melon in it. There's this character in this book, her name is Gail, and she's just positively, hilariously awful, I feel like. So. <laughs> that's so true, yeah. That's she creates so, she that's creates so much trouble on the ship. Yeah. And so she's really attractive. And 
I mean, I'm just skipping around there. So there's a character, it's almost as if like Liza could see the future when she wrote this book. And Gail's husband, um, contra he gets um, something called the norovirus, which isn't nearly as serious as COVID. But the doctor who's Jesse says, I want you to stay in quarantine in your room. And she says to Gail, and you too, don't go out of your room because we don't want you getting anybody sick. And Gail's just like, I'm not going to listen to that. I'm going to go have fun. And she completely disregards the doctor's orders. And I just thought that was so interesting and awful. And I feel like people are doing that now. And so she got, and so I just love that about the book in a way how it was not nearly as serious as what we're living through, but it kind of sort of foretold it. And, and I don't know, I enjoyed that. And I just wondered about people like Gail do, and I don't know where I'm going with this question, but just, do you want to talk about Gail and cruise ships and how you didn't know when you wrote this, what our world would be now, and you could take it in any direction you feel like you want to sell your book? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, no, obviously nobody could have imagined something as awful as COVID, but a uh, norovirus uh, was a very real thing. Um, I've taken a number of cruises and it was always a very real thing. Every time you go out of the cabin, people, uh, crew members are squirting you with Purell. Seriously? And, okay. Yeah, yeah. And they have a whole regimen they go through if somebody comes down with what is suspected to be norovirus. They mm -hmm. are quarantined. And at some point, if there are enough people quarantined, they really do have to go into port and, and um, clean the ship. Yeah. Uh, that never happened on one of my cruises, but uh, I know the cruise lines wouldn't appreciate my saying this, but I did end up getting sick on most of my long cruises. Not badly sick, but you know, a cold or, or mm -hmm. I never got norovirus, but I got little respiratory yeah. things. And uh, so it's an ideal uh, setting for disease, sadly, because right. it's a, a really great way to travel. But um, no, I, I couldn't have foreseen yeah. what happened, but as uh, you know, a lot of writers have the experience of uh, uh, you write something and then it comes true. It almost makes you uh, hesitant about writing anything. Right. Like I, I wrote a novella called um, Birdman and the Dancer in, in uh, 1991 during Desert Storm. I was so upset by uh, our 670,000 soldiers going into uh, invade Iraq, and I wrote a, a novella in which um, uh, New York City has a apocalyptic event and the Twin Towers implode. So, wow. so when that actually happened in 2001, I thought, oh my God, I don't believe I want to write anymore. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> that makes it a little bit scary what you write next, right? So... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you've got powers is what I'm figuring out. <laughs> but actually, I mean, I love the fact that you like started to write this and it wasn't working and you put it down and then you went back to it. Because, I don't know, I think that's just like a really true thing about writers sometimes. I mean, that even happened to me with, with Very Nice, which I'm, we're going to go back to you. But I really did start this as an, and I wrote 40 pages and it was so easy. And it was just so easy to write that I thought, well, this is just silly and garbage. And... I'm just gonna put it away. And like four months later, I wasn't writing anymore. So I'm like, well, I'll go back to this thing that was silly and easy and keep writing. So it's kind of like, I feel like all writers should know that they can always go back to something and it's kind of yeah. empowering. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and did you uh, enjoy writing this book? It feels yeah. like, it feels like you had fun writing it. Yeah. There were yeah. some scenes where I was reading and I did a bad job because there were like three or four times while I was reading it where I laughed out loud. And I thought, well, I need to write this down so I can like, tell you and ask you as I, I, don't, I don't do this very often but I didn't write it down but I just like this book made me laugh out loud and, and part of me just thought that I just had a feeling that this, that was effortless for you that you're not like trying to be funny do you think oh. or I, I, I want to read Kinflix very much because I've heard so much about it but this is my first book I'm sure many of your fans are here and they've read a lot but I just feel like that the humor must be a big element of your work oh well thank you yeah it, it uh, this book uh, I loved writing and it came oh, nice. fa fairly easily for me yeah. compared to most of my books. Um, mm -hmm. And partly, uh, I hate to say this, but it was because uh, my parents died in 2010. So I yeah. was no longer having to worry about what their reaction would be if. That's a big thing. Yeah, if I actually said what I thought. <laughs> I mean, I usually <laughs> try to say what I feel, but 
um, I feel guilty about it. I felt guilty about it when my parents were alive and now uh, I can just let it rip. So I did, you know, I said everything that I've been thinking for a long time, but hadn't wanted to say. So it was fun. Pressure taken away. No, I can't, I mean, nothing that I read in this book seemed like it would be upsetting to parents, but you never know what parents are going to feel. Like. You don't know my parents. <laughs> very, no, it's very true. It's really hard. Um, I think one reason why I write fiction and not nonfiction is because even if it's really autobiographical, the people who read the work don't know me personally and they have no idea. And I like fiction for that reason. Do you feel that way too? Like, have you ever tried to write essays or memoir or... Well, I've, I've written a couple of memoirs and I think they were harder for me for that reason because I, yeah. I couldn't hide behind my character. Yeah. So I really also prefer to write fiction because I think it allows me to be freer because as you say, then you can always claim that, oh, well, it's fiction, you know, yeah, totally. <laughs> not what I really said or did yeah. or thought. Right. Okay, and then like, like like one important thing I think to talk about in Swan Song, we'll hold up we'll hold up your cover. I'll try to be good. Is like, like like there's something about sexuality that's just so fluid and easy, and it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal that that Jesse had a lover for 20 years. Her partner was a woman, and then she's on the ship, and there's a doctor who's, who's male who's interested, and there's a singer who's female who's interested, and it's all just fine. You know what I mean? It's not. It's not an issue and it's just so kind of lovely and easily drawn. And I don't know if that was different, like if that would have been different to write like 15 years ago or if you liked, if you liked to, I don't know. Do you want to talk about any of that? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I guess it's because I'm a child of the 60s and yeah. 70s, you know, and those were pretty wild times. So uh, miss it was uh, pre AIDS, post pill, and. Yeah. Um, there was certainly a lot of uh, soul searching and struggling going on then, but on the whole, it was pretty, uh, pretty crazy and fun and relaxed. And um, I guess that just carries over. Yeah. I really, I mean, yeah, and it just felt, it just felt like it just felt so natural, just the writing about all of it. So I just, you know, it's not so, like, you know, there were no big issues. You're like, oh, you know what I mean? Like it was just like, just, yeah. I guess. I guess it's because I'm, you know, I'm so old now. I'm, I'm 75, and I've really pretty much seen everything and done a lot of it. And uh, it's just. I mean, I guess that could be like my last question. It's like it feels like there are not many books by people who are older where people write about sex, about sex. Do you know what I mean? Like I feel like this book, like so many people who are older, like no one's writing about me. Like I feel like this might make a lot of people really happy because there aren't enough books for other people you know what I mean I don't know if you thought about that or if you think that's well, gonna... thank you. I, I hope that's true yeah I think it yeah. is true people assume that you just kind of uh, lose interest right uh, yeah, in not a, in this book, so having a good. little life and uh, most people that I know haven't lost interest and uh, all right good to know <laughs> yeah I did want to honor that and and yeah. uh, older people yeah do you and those do you have any I mean do you have anything else you want to say about your book that I didn't really touch on or huh Oh, uh, let's see. Um, well, some people have commented on uh, uh, wondering why I made her a doctor, you know, when, okay. when uh, my main character, Jessie, is yeah. a doctor. And um, uh, uh, the reason, I think, is because I come from a family of doctors, and my grandfather was a doctor, a country doctor on a horse, mm -hmm. horseback, and my father was a doctor, and three of my siblings are doctors, and two of my nieces are doctors. Wow. So all my life, I've had to listen to these kind of conversations at the dinner table, um, what operations they did that day. And I thought, well, I have all this uh, information. I ought to use it, you know? Yeah, and, totally. Uh, I always feel like, as a writer, by the way, that I'm really lazy. And I don't want to do research. I have never done research yet. So, I mean, it's really great to take advantage of what you sort of know, right? Do you feel that way or? Yeah. I do, yeah. I thought I'd better use this material because when Yeah. Else? I mean, I couldn't believe that you were a doctor for reading it. So I guess that your exposure to doctor was, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> so you I, don't have a second career. Yeah. I was supposed to be a doctor. Uh, That's what I figured, yeah. But the problem was I had a blood disease when I was seven and I, developed a blood phobia so uh i couldn't very well be a doctor with a blood phobia so i had no. to settle for writing novels instead <laughs> <laughs> uh 
Um, but I want to ask about um, about your book now. Sure. Um, okay. <laughs> Um, we're doing good, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, we're, we're, we're <laughs> taking turns here. Um, I, uh, you know, the, how when you write a uh, book proposal or a proposal for a film script, they always like yeah. you to um, to say, you know, this is Hannibal Lecter moves to Little House on the Prairie or something. So no. I was trying to think, what would I compare um, your book very nice to? Oh, it uh, Thank you. I'm going to hold up the paperback cover just because it's so different. Oh, see? sorry. <laughs> oh, <laughs> totally yeah. cool. It's fine. Yeah, that's great. Oh, Thanks uh, for having me. You know, since I'm a generation older than you, these comparisons mm -hmm. may not resonate for you, but okay. uh, how it impressed me was that Very Nice is a stepchild of John Cheever and Ernest Hemingway. And the reason oh. I say that is um, Cheever, you know, wrote about suburban Connecticut, and your book is set totally. in suburban and his, um, a lot of his stories have backyard swimming pools in them. And yours that. has a yeah. very important swimming pool in it. And um, the reason I thought of Ernest Hemingway is because of your style. You, you use mm -hmm. short, simple sentences, simple words, very few yeah. adjectives or adverbs. Yeah. And um, the only difference is that you're hilariously funny and Ernest Thank Hemingway you. wasn't. So. Uh, I just at random picked out a, a passage just to show uh, people what I was talking about. Uh, so I thought I'd just read a few sentences if you don't mind. Thank you. Yeah. This is uh, Zahib. The, uh, he's a Pakistani novelist who has mm -hmm. come to live in the suburban Connecticut house of uh, an older woman. And he's starting to have an affair with her. So uh, he says it's in his head. He says, I needed a few more weeks in Connecticut, all that equanimity, all that good health, fresh air and good food, good sex. I was swimming laps every day. I could swim a length of the pool underwater without taking a breath. I could do a flip turn. I had made significant improvements. I was not ready for the next step. I did not want to have a job. I was a writer for Christ's sake. Yeah, totally. <laughs> So um, you always do that, and it cracks me up. You have these short, succinct sentences, and then a, and then like a punchline that makes you laugh out loud. So, Made me laugh. So that's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, I hate having to have a job as a writer, which I still do. It's so funny because I'm nothing like Zahid. But I, he, I gave him a lot of my thoughts about writing. I just made him a lot more successful than I was. But what's interesting to me, totally, but swimming pools, like so much of that book is set in a swimming pool. And yeah. that book, I mean, a lot of this novel was swimming pool envy, like the pool and the house where that book was set was the house that I'd been to as a guest. But I was very much like, you can come visit us once a year kind of thing. And, and so that whole book is set in a house that once a year I got to go visit. And it's so interesting because right now Zahid is like, I just love this pool and I don't want to leave. Like he knows he doesn't, he hasn't earned this pool and he's not going to stay. And, and everything comes back to like right now as a writer, right now, all the public pools are still closed. And I'm currently, as of last week, paying to swim in somebody's pool in their backyard. And it's just like heavenly. And <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a little bit like Zahid, except that I have to pay, and I'm taking swimming lessons because that's how I found out about the pool. They give lessons, so I'm improving my stroke in order to swim in a pool. So <laughs> I, that doesn't address Cheever, but it, it addresses swimming, which is really important to me. So yeah. Mm. Well, okay. you know Cheever and uh, Hemingway, but when you were starting to write, that you have such a distinctive style. Um, yeah. are, are there any writers that particularly inspired you or um, that you I'd always I always go blank to that to a certain extent I studied I don't know I mean I don't know if you went to a writing program but I studied with um Frederick Barthelme and Mary Robeson and they're kind of famous for their short sentences and minimalist styles and and I really liked them which is one reason why I went to a oh I think this was something you said in my talk I went to a writing program in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, which was like the middle of nowhere, and it's not a great place to live, but I loved it. I was only there for two years, and I had these great writing teachers, and I left San Francisco to go to Hattiesburg to study with writers who work I really like, especially Mary's. I really have always loved Mary Robinson's writing, mm -hmm. and, and this novel, strangely enough, was more inspired 
instead of by other writers. It was like, I wasn't thinking, this book has been compared just once to Cheever, I think because of the pools, but I was really thinking about television and I watch a lot of television and I, I watch soap operas even, which is embarrassing, but I don't care anymore. But I, I thought, well, why don't I write a, like a literary soap opera to some extent? And then, hmm. I don't know, like so, it's, yeah. It's very visual, you know. It, yeah. It'd be good for television or movies. I hope so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it's very, very visual and a lot of good snappy dialogue and, yeah. uh, um, what was it like? I know you grew up in uh, New Jersey and you right. live there now. What was it yeah. like to go to Southern Mississippi to writing school? Was that bizarre? It is bizarre. I mean, especially because I came from, I left San Francisco to write, go to writing school in Mississippi. And, you know, the UPS man would like bring me my boxes and he'd be like, why'd you move here? And then I would go to um, like the department and they knew I came from San Francisco. They're like, why'd you come here? And I was like, well, it's cheap. And I, I went to a school where, I got a fellowship, so I got paid to go there. So that's kind of good. Like sometimes people now go to MFA programs where they go into debt, and that just doesn't uh -huh. make any yeah. sense as, yeah. as creative writers. And it was just, it was never, well, I guess sometimes people go to school and they end up staying there, but it was sort of more, like, I don't know, I got graduated from college and I got a full-time job. And the one thing I didn't want to do was work. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the heat. I didn't, I just didn't want to work full time and I didn't know how to be a writer and work. And so I'm like, well, why don't I go to school and get paid to go to school? So Mississippi was just great for that reason, just because I got a lot of, I got money, not a lot, but I got enough money that I could go to school and not work. Mm -hmm. And I could drive to New Orleans and eat oysters and kind of experience mm -hmm. that culture. And back then I rented a house that was $350 a month. And mm -hmm. I don't know. And yep. it, it always just, felt temporary so it felt pretty wonderful yeah yeah, yeah. Well, i wouldn't want to live there forever yeah well for me one one thing that i noticed was um uh with your other books um you mostly wrote from one character's point of view yeah. and i'm so interested in this one that um you have five characters i believe and it's what? almost like six degrees of separation because as you read the book, you realize uh, that they're connected into, in ways that you would never have expected. For instance, um, uh, there's a woman pilot who flies a plane that yeah. the Pakistani author is on. The Pakistani author is having an affair with the wife of the man that the pilot is having an affair with. You know, so you have all these moments where you think, what? You know, and all the characters are connected. And right. I was wondering what, what made you decide to write from multiple points of view? Um, well, yeah, this was, a, this was a departure for me. And like, um, I think I wrote the first, the first chapter of this book was a short story and it was meant to be a standalone short story. And then I finished it and I didn't know what to do next. And a writer friend said, well, this is what she tells her students. She says, write from the mother's point of view. And so I did that. So the second chapter is from the mother's point of view. And then I wrote the chapter from the writer's point of view. And then there's this other character in this book who's really random because she's the subletter of the writer and there's no real reason for her to be in the book, but she's what came into my head. I don't know, we can talk to you. You can jump back into your, to your writing process too. Like I feel like when I write, I really just want to entertain myself. Like sometimes people ask, and when I'll ask this question back to you, is like people ask you, what, who's your audience? Like who are you writing for? And sometimes I really, I think I'm writing for myself sometimes. I'm like, I'm like, this is what's pleasing me. So there's a scene where the, with a scene that you mentioned where the pilot meets the other character and they, they, they kind of, their stories intersect and they don't even know that they're intersecting. I didn't know I was going to do it until I did it. And then that just pleased me so much. I was like, this is so awesome. And that's why I like to write. Like I actually like writing. Like sometimes a lot of people think writing is really painful and awful and pulling out your teeth and they show all the alcoholic writers in movies. But when I'm actually writing, which isn't most of the time, I don't write every day. And I mean, you can go back and then we'll ask you about your writing process, which I forgot to do before. I, when I'm writing, I'm happier than when I'm not writing. And when I please myself, it usually works out. Yeah. I'm, so, I agree. I, I yeah. love to write. I absolutely <laughs> nice. love to. Yeah. That's the best time I have, which will Give you some idea of what the rest of my life is like but no, I mean, yeah, you've, you've written more novels and i've written novels it's just so great you know what i mean so yeah yeah it's it's, it's really fun right 
do you, do you plan or do you, I don't know. I feel like I'm bored. I, um, no, I, well, it's, it's so random, you know, it's like, uh, uh, with several of the novels, I wrote a short story and I thought that that would be it. Yeah. And then the short story would kind of fester. And then suddenly I would find that it was, you know, like Jack's beanstalk. It was expanding into a, a endless novel. And uh, no, I, I never really plan. I, I uh, start writing down scenes that come into my head. Mm -hmm. And eventually I start seeing how the scenes could fit together into a narrative. And once I have a vague plot, then I start maybe making a few uh, notes, but never really an outline. It just, the, for me, the interesting part of writing is um, the process of discovery. Yeah. The fact that I don't know what I'm going to write. And, right. And then it's just there are these strange characters in your head that are talking, right? They're talking through you. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. I think that's what makes it so much fun. Exactly. How do you, you have a, a child, how, how do you manage to write with a child at home? It's tricky. Um, I mainly, I mean, I'm kind of lucky. I'm not lucky. I mean, I also edit novels to make money, but I kind of just use her school time to write. And that's just somehow I've, I've made, managed to make that enough. You know what I mean? So my time, except for during quarantine when I have no time, is, um, you know, between like nine to three are my hours. And, and if I, I don't, I don't know if some people write a lot. I don't, I'm not really that effective. Like when I'm really deep into a book, I can write for four or five hours. Like I have done it. But in general, if I put in a good two hours, like that just feels amazing. And that's all I've got. But you can just write, I can write so much in two hours hmm. that I can still also like buy groceries and sort of clean up and waste time and pick hmm. up daughter from the school bus that's how I've done it I don't know so sometimes I feel like sometimes I feel like writers who teach which is something I don't know I don't know if you've ever taught before teaching just seems so draining like I always wonder about authors who teach how they write books and they do but they sometimes have to go to sabbatical or they use their summers I think it's all about time for all writers right so yeah. I use school time for my writing time yeah I, I um, have taught a, a couple of times and uh, and found it was really hard work right. yeah, yeah. Those, they those professors really and they were hard and students hard. want a lot they want to email you and <laughs> yeah. I've, the way i've always written i guess i got into the habit when i had a, a baby uh -huh. was um just uh if i'm working on a book i'd go away for a week or two weeks every, right. every chance i get and um yeah. skip vacations and go go away and then I do nothing but write and eat and sleep for and then I'd come back home and I could do the typing and editing yeah. and stuff but um and when I did that I, I don't know this was when I was young I'm not sure I could do it anymore but I'd write for 12 or 14 hours Me too. yeah I wish I could do that hmm. that's great it seems like that'd be really crazy and fun and sometimes well sometimes. the good thing about it is that you don't have to break your concentration to you know right uh, real life yeah. in the rug and uh, you you can just stay in in that state and not have to come out of it for a certain amount so you can get a whole lot done yeah but i guess finding finding how to get concentrated is the hardest part it really is i mean sometimes i feel like obstacles are good like that i sometimes have so that i don't have a lot of time to write makes me use the time better than if I had all day. Like, I mean, I think you need too much time. And sometimes, sometimes my writing time is actually not this summer. I usually have a lot of time because my ex-husband will take my daughter for extended periods of time. And sometimes I do go on writing binges when she's gone. But sometimes I feel like, oh, if I have all day to write and nothing else, it's just so much pressure that I'll just waste the time. So mm. if I just have a shorter amount of time, then I'll get really into it and have to stop which is idiotic, yeah, that's, that's what right. makes me work, so, and I've run for catching my daughter's school bus so many times, because I get caught up, and I'm like, oh my god, I have to go get her, so that's happened, but I've never actually missed the bus, which is pretty good, yeah. I was wondering, um, what is it about you and twins? I know I you're- I love twins, right? <laughs> you're for, are you a twin? You're I'm not a twin. The novel was called Twins, and it was right. how these twins, it was a fascinating book, about how they exchange personalities, basically, yeah. in the course of the book. 
Twins but, are just so interesting, right? Yeah. I don't even know that many twins in real life. So I think they're, yeah, they just really captivate me. You have twins in, in this, this book too, very nice. Yeah. Two uh, biracial twins. One yeah. of them is a lesbian in finance and the other is a writer. Yeah. And that, I don't know about you with writing a few books. Like that was out of my, my comfort zone. Like one way I thought that I could get, I was worried then I wrote this book then that I could get into trouble because I wrote from the point of view of a Pakistani character and I wrote from the point of view of, of a biracial woman and I wrote and I don't know I feel like there were some people who did like do you ever go on Goodreads and read your reviews or I think that's more of a recent thing I never had there's there some people who just hated the characters in this book and some people and then some people were just like oh my god I know so many Zahids like I've had so many like people of color tell me that they know this man. Like, I feel like I know this man. So I feel like you have to, it was good to step out of my comfort zone to write mm -hmm. anyway. Do you know what I mean? And I want to make that. Well, so, you'd, like, you'd like to think that there's some common core of humanity that we lovely. all share that could yeah. allow you to understand what the life of somebody different from you. I hope so, is. yeah. But, uh, it, I guess the phrase now is cultural appropriation, isn't it? That Right. You, you shouldn't try to work your way into a culture that's not your own. Right. But then um, if you only write about, I don't know. I just don't know. Then they say you're boring. So you yeah, can't right. win. Yeah. <laughs> well, is it too early for, it's only 7.35 to answer questions. I can see that. I, I open the chat window and I can see all these people writing things, but I can't. Read I, think I, oh, I, I think I have a couple of questions for each awesome. of you. Okay. Thank uh, the you. first is for Liza, and it's about your epigraph, the Lawrence Durrell quote, and why why that quote? Huh. Uh, that's a good question, and I don't actually know the answer to it. I was just reading, I can't even remember which of his books it was in, but uh, I was reading that book, and I just came across it, and I thought, oh, that's what I'm trying to do in this book. So I just grabbed it and um, it continued to resonate for me so I just kept it and used it as the epigraph. And a, another right. question, right. let's see. I brought a cat. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta keep myself entertained. Okay. <laughs> let's see. Uh, somebody asked if, if both of you could talk a little bit more about the, your writing process and how it changed over time. If there were any characters in each of your books that were had bigger roles, maybe in that first finished draft that had to be shortened, uh, or whether the editing process was more a matter of style rather than character and plot. Uh, Marcy, would you like to take that one first? Marcy and Marcy's cat, would you like to take that one first? <laughs> Um, I put my, the new thing I'm writing now, I put my cats in it, just <laughs> because, um, this was, this sometimes, it's funny working with an editor, like, you never know what's going to happen after you sell a book, what, what's going to, what your editor's going to want you to do, and in this case was very nice, um, my editor was really pregnant, which I didn't know at the time, <laughs> and she was just like, let's get this done quickly, because your book is fine, and she almost gave me no work to do, and I don't think it's because she was pregnant I think that's how she felt but it was it was so easy and I just liked that so much that I really didn't have to make that many significant changes where the changes she wanted me to make I'm like oh yeah that makes sense and I'll do it but she didn't say let's do this or let's cut this character or she actually want I mean the character of Chloe who's like a biracial lesbian she wanted me to write more about Chloe being black and I'm glad that she did so sometimes a great thing about having an editor is they push you to go a little bit further. Like maybe I was nervous about that. So she made me write more about that. And the very last scene of my novel previously, of this novel, previously, previously I had a strict order. Like every character, there are four characters and one interloping character. And they, they just, every, every time they, they took a turn and I actually skipped the order. I broke my own rule to write from the last chapter from the mother's point of view. And she's like, no, that has to be from the daughter's point of view. And so editors are just like the best because I literally wrote the same scene the exact same things happen but by changing the point of view it just got that much better so i think that's like a great thing but otherwise it was essentially the same book 
Hmm. I hope that answered that question. Yeah. yeah. And Liza, for you, you've worked with um, a few really incredible editors. Um, and with this book in particular, were there any uh, really good instructive uh, edits that came in that really helped you re-see the book? Well, I, I feel as though I've, I've been very lucky in my career. I've had great editors and um, you know, one, one quality they've all shared is, um, you know, they, they suggest they don't require. So it's like having a, um, I always felt it was like having a good therapist, you know, that they can, they can go through and um, see patterns that you're not yourself aware of. So on this particular book, I had a wonderful editor, uh, Victoria Wilson at Knopf, and she had edited my, uh, fourth novel, Bedrock. So we had worked together and had a very good time on that book. So I was absolutely thrilled when she wanted to do this book as well. And um, she really helped it be a much better book than it was, I think. There were some, a lot of, there were some things that were unresolved with my ending that I hadn't really thought through. And, um, you know, big questions about death and love. And uh, she kept asking me questions that made me keep rethinking it until finally it kind of snapped into place for me like a, a jigsaw puzzle. And it was because of her uh, questions that that happened. So um, I'm really grateful for, for her uh, intervention. <laughs> uh, also in the chat, Ellen, asks if Liza or maybe both of you could expand on your earlier statement about the common core of humanity and whether that's something you make a special point of of exhibiting or advocating for in your work. You can start, Liza. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, earlier in my career, I, I tried to do more of that because there, there wasn't this, um, uh, attitude that you needed to write about only your own uh, gender or your own culture. Uh, I, I tried to write from the point of view of a young black man in my novel, Original Sins. And I've tried to write from the point of view of, in my, in Kinflicks, I wrote from the point of view of a much older woman who was uh, dying, which was a bit of a stretch for me because I was in my early thirties then. and. Uh, I've tried to write from the point of view of different people in different classes, but um, this particular book, Swan, Swan Song, is uh, all me. <laughs> I, I uh, have always had a hard time with um, trying to reconcile the fact that my father was a Virginian and my mother was a New Yorker, and those two cultures are so different from each other, and I never saw how to bring them together. So. In this book, I, I made uh, Jessie the doctor a northerner and um, her lover, Kat, a southerner. And I resolved the issue by having them be lovers. So this uh, novel was all about me. So I didn't really have to uh, deal with the topic of whether I would be allowed to write about characters very different from myself. I would be reluctant to do that now, probably. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think it it might be a a regional thing too. Uh, one of my favorite writers is Alan Greganis. Uh, mm -hmm. And he wrote, maybe I'll throw it in the chat. You know, I, I so miss uh, this part of book selling of just talking about books with people. Uh, but I just threw into the chat an essay by Alan Greganis called My Cultural Misappropriation about being raised in the South and wanting to write in the myriad voices of the South and not not merely his own, um, but I'll leave that there for people to click on if they, if they want. Um, Marcy, do you want to speak to the, to the, the mission of writing toward the common core of humanity and your work, whether that feels true? I, think, I mean, one of the things I like about writing as opposed to watching TV or movies is that you get to write from inside the characters' heads. And that's one of my favorite things is just sort of like the interior monologue. And that's just trying to hear, to see how people think and feel. And that's why I think I like to write. Like that's one of my favorite parts of writing. 
So I think that's just naturally what fiction writers do. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think I have well, one more for Liza and then one for the both of you. Um, Liza, do we get to find out from Liza what happened to Gail? <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be the first question that all my friends that read the book ask. Uh, what happened to Gail? I don't want to be, be uh, a spoiler, but uh, when I decided at first to write a murder mystery, um, I thought, well, uh, murder mysteries always end tidily, and you know who did it and why, and um, there's a certain formula you follow. But the reality is that 40% of murders are never solved. So I thought, wouldn't it be more uh, realistic uh, not to solve this murder, you know? So uh, everybody has their theory about where she is and what happened to her. But the truth is that I don't know. I might have to write a sequel to figure it out. <laughs> and then um, a question for both of you. Uh, have the times, the times we're in, stifled your creativity? Or have you felt inspired to, uh, to sit down at the desk and write uh, either? something completely imaginary, because something completely fictional, or have you felt the urge to write about what's happening now? Marcy, would you like to answer that first? How's your writing coming these days? It's not coming great at all. <laughs> my daughter's just not at school, and she's not at day camp, and she knows if ever I try to do something like that, that's when she needs me. And I'm just, I'm just not trying and it seems like way too soon to write about what's happening now and people are and I want to read it but I'm not I'm not ready to approach it so I'm right. taking a little break and I wonder how Liza's is doing I would love to know well every every time um after I finish a book I always think that's it you know I've said everything I have to say and sure. uh, so I'm going to retire and that's the that's the phase I'm in right now. But in the past, the you know, I the the well would fill back up again, and I'd start wanting to write again. But I don't know. May, maybe it won't this time. I'm going to wait and see. But it seems to me world events um, have become so surreal that there's almost not a role for fiction anymore. I mean, yeah, we couldn't make this up any of it. Yeah. And the president, yeah. like, I can't even, it's like when you can't believe what he does, and he does something else, and you really can't believe it. So how can we yeah. write something as crazy as that? Like, yeah. Really this, nobody would say it was possible. I mean, you can't, the problem is, I mean, that's one thing I loved about your book, Marcy, was that you acknowledged uh, what the, the current events, there was an issue with a, a, a gun in a school, and uh, yeah. one of your characters was, uh, 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 lesbian and uh, the twins were uh, biracial and you acknowledge the the issues that were going on in the world at the time that this was said mm -hmm. um, you didn't um, didn't have to delve into them too deeply mm -hmm. but you acknowledge them but yeah. now I don't know how you would even just acknowledge and and go on if you're dealing with this pandemic I I can't see a way to to write about it, but maybe there is a way. I don't know. Is there anything either of you have been reading? Uh, I know it's been hard to, it's been hard for me to focus uh, for most of the pandemic, but every now and then I have found a book to really arrest my attention and, and transport me. Have you read anything in the past couple months that you'd recommend? Me? <laughs> um, I've been reading Marcy's books, and uh, <laughs> I read all four of them, and I oh. really recommend them. She's hilarious, and, um, you know, they're, they're, they're very good read. They just, uh, you can't put them down. So um, <laughs> that's what I've been reading. <laughs> so nice. I didn't set myself up. I didn't know that. <laughs> I have been finding it hard to read, and I don't know. It's like this is just really depressing right now, right? I mean, it definitely... Like, like, I was so happy that I got to read Liza's book because it was just like fun. Like, it, you know, like I, I enjoyed it. I read, um, there's, there's a real, in publishing right now, there's a real like, great idea. Like, let's try to make black authors into bestsellers because of, of um, 
racism in this country. And I read one book that it was just a real pleasure, which is, it was already a bestseller, so I didn't help her career. It was Such a Fun Age by Riley Keed, and that was really enjoyable. And it started with like the most arresting scene ever. And then it just became like a domestic drama, but I really enjoyed that, Such a Fun Age. And I don't, I don't know, but I think, I think I have, sometimes I've been liking reading more than television right now. So I think it's always really good to escape in a book. Yeah. But yeah. I've been having a hard time reading because I feel as though I'm kind of stuck in flight or fight mode. Yeah. And, and that if I take my attention off the present and get lost in a book, you know, that um, I'll be overwhelmed or I don't know. <laughs> Let it down by these uh, this evil virus or something, but it's been hard for me to concentrate. What What do you recommend, John? What do I recommend? <laughs> I just got back to Brooklyn a week ago. I've been stocking the shelves, taking books off the shelves to send them to our customers. The last great book I read, and I think we might have stock on it, um, it's a book, an older book called The Fiery Pantheon by an author named Nancy Lemon. Um, she's from New Orleans. She's really good at writing about uh, elegant Southern uh, men and women falling to pieces. I, it's, they're very, very funny books. She has a book called Lives of the Saints. I don't know if that one's in print, but The Fiery Pantheon is still around. Um, I'll post it on the website. It's it's a real scream. Uh, she was one of the Gordon Lish writers from the 90s, but one yeah. that wasn't read as widely. Um, a good rediscovery for me. Uh, it sounds right down my alley. <laughs> <laughs> well, Marcy and Liza, we're so glad that we could do this tonight. Um, yeah. Thank you for letting us host you this way. Uh, Liza will bring you back for the paperback. Marcy will host you for your for what comes next. And hold up our books, right? I'll hold up Liza's books too. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you everybody for tuning in tonight. That was really a lot of fun. You can buy their books at McNallyJackson.com. You'll see the little events carousel on the right. Um, but thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, John. Have a wonderful night. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.